We have a study sheet for you tonight. If you don't have one of these sheets, if you'll just raise your hand, uh, we'll get one right to you. We've got plenty of them, enough for everybody to have one. We've been talking about the significance of doctrine. The significance of doctrine in the ministry of Christ. The significance of doctrine in the New Testament. And we have seen the great significance that is placed upon doctrine in the Bible. The word doctrine comes from a Greek word simply means teaching that which is taught or to teach. Last Sunday evening we looked at the various phrases that are used in the New Testament to describe doctrine. And this, of course, teaches us what is the true nature of doctrine. Tonight, I want us to discuss doctrinal accuracy. First of all, we all must understand that there is such a thing as sound doctrine. There are even those in the religious world today saying there isn't any such thing as sound doctrine. But the New Testament says there is such a thing as sound doctrine. In Titus chapter 1, verse number 5, Paul left a preacher by the name of Titus on the island of Crete. And he wrote him a letter, and this is what he said in verse number 5, For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city as I had appointed thee. Paul left Titus on the island of Crete because the congregations there were in disarray. They were in disorder. He was to set things in order. One of the first things he was to do is ordain elders in every congregation, in every town that had a congregation, Titus 1.5. Now in verse 6 and following, you'll find out what kind of men he was to select to be elders or to appoint to be elders in these congregations. They were to be men who held fast to the faithful word so that they could convict and convince those who contradicted sound doctrine, verse 9 through verse 11 of chapter 1. But notice what he said in chapter 2, verse number 1. As he leaves this preacher to do this work among these congregations, he said, But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine." How could anybody say they believe the New Testament and not believe there is sound doctrine? When here by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, this preacher is told, you be sure that you speak the things that become sound doctrine. Look in verse number 7. He said to him, In all things, showing yourselves a pattern of good works in doctrine, showing uncorruptest sincerity. His doctrine had to be straightforward. It had to be exactly what God directs in His Word. There could be no corruption, no man-made element. He could only teach doctrine that was of a gravity. That means that comes from the God of heaven. He couldn't choose his own doctrine. He had to choose what was given to him by God. The word accuracy, when we talk about doctrinal accuracy, that simply means to be free from error. That means you have the doctrine of Almighty God that does not have mixed within it the ideas, the commandments, and the beliefs of human beings. That's 
doctrinal accuracy. Sound doctrine is accurate. Unsound doctrine is inaccurate. Why is this study so important? Number one, because of the stress that is laid on doctrinal accuracy in your New Testament. That makes this study of the utmost importance. Because through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, God has made this clear that this matter is of the utmost importance. Most important thing in the church is not how many activities that we have going on. If not as this group is happy, and this group is happy, and this family's okay, and this family's okay, number one, doctrinal accuracy. Is the congregation being fed doctrine that is accurate, that they can read for themselves right within their own Bibles? So that's the first reason it's important, because of the stress laid on in the New Testament. The second reason this is so important is because so many people today don't see the importance of it. I don't know how many members of the church I've met that just say, well, no, I just know they're a loving preacher. I don't know about their doctrine. I've had members of the church tell me, I don't care about his doctrine. I know he loves people. You know He loves people. And you don't care about His doctrine. Very little emphasis is placed upon doctrine in the denominational world. And it has come to that point in many of the congregations of my brethren that doctrinal accuracy is no longer important, just if we love everyone. And just as we get along, just as we have peace, that's all, that's all, that's number one in people's mind, not doctrinal accuracy. So the second reason it's so important is because of the little importance placed on it by people today. All right, let's look at 2 Timothy 4, verse 3. 2 Timothy 4, verse 3. Paul, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, said, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. Now think about that. The word endure in the original language means to forbear, means to bear with, means to put up with. The time is going to come in the church when brethren will not put up with sound doctrine. For instance, if you were going to discuss the subject of children's church, the brethren that I've tried to discuss with it and ask them where they get the authority in the New Testament for doing it, every time the answer is men, well, I don't see anything wrong with it. It's nowhere condemned in the Scriptures. Is that not not what the denominational people have argued with us for centuries concerning instrumental music? The matter of doctrinal accuracy doesn't interest these people. My children love it. They're learning things on their own level. That's That's what's important. The doctrinal issue never comes to these people's minds. Paul is telling us, and he's talking about the church, the the time's going to come in the church when brethren in the church will no longer put up with sound doctrine. They're not going to have it. Now, this is a fascinating word. It's also found in Ephesians 4.2, where Paul lists all those beautiful personal qualities for us to have unity in the church. And you notice what he says in the last part of that verse in Ephesians 4.2, we are to for, be forbearing in love. That's the same Greek word that's used here. It means put up with each other. 
That's a task. That's an adventure. But that's what it means to be a Christian. To learn how to put up with each other in love. We all come from different backgrounds, and yet we're all in the one body of Christ. And he said the time's going to come when people won't want to hear sound doctrine. Those who have done studies on this Greek word say it means that the time will come when people won't want to listen to it any longer. See, that's all the church used to have. I, I remember in the 60s, that's all we had. Because the elders wouldn't do children's church. Elders wouldn't hire preachers that were liberal. They wouldn't even hire preachers that even had the idea that they might be liberal. Back in those days, elders wouldn't hire them. So they couldn't get a job. So they couldn't get a hearing. Now elders have become weak and they hire these birds and they can spout their false doctrine anywhere. The time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. They won't want to listen to it. Reminds us of Acts 17, 11. These were more noble than those at, at Thessalonica and that they received the word with all readiness of mind. And they searched the Scriptures daily whether those things were so. There is sound doctrine. What does that word mean? The word sound. The time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. What does that mean? In the Greek language, that word means healthy. You see, what God says is good for you, whether you like it or not, whether it appeals to you. What God says, He made you. <laughs> what He says is good for you. It's healthy. It's what you need to hear. Whether you know it or not, it's what you need. It makes you stronger as a Christian. It makes you better equipped to fight against Satan and his snares. It is healthy. Now it makes sense, doesn't it, to you? If there is a sound doctrine, then there is an unsound doctrine. If there is a healthy doctrine then there is a doctrine that's not healthy. On the second point on your outline, there is a different doctrine. That's what the Bible refers to it as. There is a different doctrine. The commandments of men. That's a different doctrine than sound doctrine. In vain do they worship me, teach him for doctrines, the commandments of men. Matthew 15, verse 9. In Colossians 2, 22, Paul is talking about all these doctrines and commandments of men that come with religious people, and he said they are all to perish with the using. If you use the commandments of men in your teaching, they're going to perish. The Word of God's going to stand forever, 1 Peter 1.25. But these commandments of men are going to perish. Colossians 2, verse 22. They're not going to last. They come from men. Titus 1.14. You remember Paul left Titus on that island and he warned him about the commandments of men in Titus 1.14? Do you believe what Paul said? Oh, I just love the Bible. Do you love all of it? This is what Paul warned him about. He said, the commandments of men turn people away from the truth. Well, the atheists look at all these churches and all these different doctrines and different names all teaching different things and they just laugh. And they say, that's what God brought to earth? God didn't bring that to earth. God didn't bring denominations. Human beings brought in that stuff. Not God. 
1 Corinthians 14, 33, God's not the author of confusion. He didn't bring that to religion. We, human beings, brought that into God's true religion. So when you're talking about a different, a different doctrine, the first thing you've got to talk about is the commandments of men. Mark chapter 7, verse 8 and 9. Jesus addressed this very issue. And He says, You lay aside the commandments of God that you may keep your traditions. He said, Full well you reject the commandment of God that you may keep your own traditions. Mark 7, 8 and 9. People start doing stuff in our congregation, whether it's children's church or what, whatever you want to think about, that's brought in, that's not found in the Bible, and they're determined they're going to have it. It doesn't matter if they can find a scripture for it. It doesn't matter if they can defend it. My children like it. My grandchildren like it. I don't see anything wrong with it. So they bring in these traditions that are not found in the Bible, and before you, before you know it, Jesus says right here, they're going to reject the commandment of God so they can do what they want to do. Mark 7, verse 8 and 9. So you have the traditions of men contrasted with the doctrines of God. Destructive heresy. That's what God calls it. It's not very merciful, is it? Destructive heresy. Say, oh, H.D., you're too hard on it. Look what God says. It's what God says about it, not what H.D. thinks. 2 Peter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1. Peter said now in the Old Testament they had false prophets. You can read all about them. We studied about them today in Jeremiah 23. In the Old Testament they had false prophets and he says to the church, and there will be false teachers among you, this is the church, who shall privily bring in damnable heresies. Teaching that condemns men's souls. Because they're not found in the Bible. Say, well, I don't, I don't see anything so harmful about children's church, the 70 AD theory, the direct operation of the Holy Spirit. I, I, don't, see any, I don't see anything so harmful. I don't see anything so destructive. I don't see anything so bad about it. Why are people get so excited about it? If God says it's a destructive, damnable heresy, what does that say to you? Galatians 1. Galatians 1, verse 6. Every Christian ought to have this verse memorized. Galatians 1, verse 6. I marvel that you're so soon removed from Him that called you into the grace of Christ into another gospel which is not another but there be some who trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ there's other gospels out there he said there's not really another one there's not another one that God accepts but there's other ones out there that men have brought in And since it's not in conformity with what we can find in the New Testament, since it doesn't match the pattern of sound words we have in the New Testament, God says it's another gospel. Now think about this, Romans 1.16, the gospel is God's power to save your soul. You bring in another gospel. I don't care how excited, how charismatic, how wonderful, and how much you love them. You bring in another gospel. Your soul cannot be saved. There's only one gospel that can save your soul. That's the one you can read about in the pages of the New Testament. Any other one can't. So it's called another 
gospel. 2 Timothy 2.16, I like this one. It's called profane babblings. You, meet, you read Mac Deaver's new book, which Bear Valley School of Preaching has fellowship with Mac Deaver, or not with Mac, but with Wayland Deaver, who came up with this stuff. And this is, he goes on and on about the Holy Spirit. On and on and on, page after page. Not things that are found in the Bible. Things that Mac Deaver and his son and some other false brethren have come up with in their minds page after page of that stuff. It takes forever to read it. You know, I thought when it came out, well, man, you can read this thing in about two or three days and, and have it all down. Man, it takes forever to read all that stuff because it's page after page after page of stuff that's not even found in the Bible. Then he'll write all of these things and then just put a scripture behind it. And you're just supposed to believe because this is Dr. Deaver. You just got to believe it. He's got a scripture behind it. Vain and profane babblings. I marked the Deavers because I can read with my own eyes what they said. Not because I heard somebody or I got something off of the internet or I think, or I feel, I can read right here what those people believe. So I, I, I don't have a bit of hesitancy in marking those brethren as false teachers. Now if somebody just told me, well, I think they believe this, or it's a pretty good idea because they hang around this group and this group, I wouldn't get up and mark them. But I can read that book and prove to you that they are teaching false doctrine to this brotherhood. And you say, well, nobody's listened to it. Many preachers in the Dallas area are listening to it. Vain babblings. Vain and profane babblings. 2 Timothy 2, verse 16, Paul says to Timothy, you shun those things. Stay away from those things. First Timothy 4 1. Here's a startling passage. The Spirit speaketh expressly. That means plain. It's clear. It's not hard to understand. What's the Spirit say that's so clear and plain? That in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. You see, God has no mercy on false doctrine. He's not going to just say, well, you know, these brethren did the best they could. They just didn't know any better. Uh, they have the same New Testament I have. They can read as well, probably better than I can. So why shouldn't they know? Doctrines of devils. Doctrine. God has no mercy toward these false doctrines. God is not sympathetic toward it like we are. He hates it. God hates false doctrine. So these are the different terms that all of these different doctrines are called that you can read about in your Bible. And it helps you to understand the very nature of these false doctrines. Now, in Romans 16, 17, and 18, Paul made a command to the church at Rome. He commanded them, marked them, which caused divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine. See, it's got to contradict the doctrine. 
contrary to the doctrine which you have heard, and avoid them. You believe that part of the Bible? You think that part of the Bible's love and mercy? You, you just kind of ignore that part? That's a command of God, just like baptism. Just like taking the Lord's Supper. Mark them. Some churches have never marked anybody and never would. They're too full of love and pity. And yet God says to do it. Mark those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you've learned and avoid them. Now in 2 Timothy 2 verse 18, here's an example of Romans 16, 17, and 18. Here's an example of it. He calls out their name. Hymenaeus and Philetus. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine H.D. got up there and called out Waylon Deaver, Mac Deaver? Can you believe that? Called out people who believe in children's church? Can you believe we do that here? We've got a pretty good example to follow right here in the Bible, or is that too old-fashioned for you? He called out their name. He said, concerning the truth they have heard. And they are teaching that the resurrection has already passed, and they overthrow the faith of some, 2 Timothy 2, 17 and 18. So Paul didn't just say, mark people. Here's an example where he did it. Here's an example where Paul did it. Romans 1.16 The gospel is God's power to save. Now if you add something to that gospel, then it's not the same anymore. It's of a different nature. You've combined human elements with God's elements. It's not, it's not the same nature anymore. It's not the same thing. You add human admixture to that, you don't have the gospel anymore. You've got the gospel plus the ideas of men. It's the gospel that saves your soul. You add something to it, you don't have the gospel anymore, and you're going to be lost. That's how serious it is. Romans 6, 17. These people were saved because they obeyed the right doctrine. Matthew 21, 25. Jesus said the baptism of John, is it from heaven or is it from men? Ever practice in the church. Just start with any of them that's coming up right now. Ever practice that's coming up. Well, what about this, HD? What about this? Is it okay to do this? Is it okay to have a choir? Is this okay? Is this okay? I think it makes our worship better. Better in whose sight? Every religious practice. We can ask this question in Matthew 21, 25. We can ask the question. Is it from heaven? Or is it from men? What you practice where you worship. Can you find it in the New Testament where they did that? Well, no, but I don't think anything's wrong. I ask you, could you find it in your New Testament? Is it from heaven? Is it from men? Any doctrine, you can ask that question. Sprinkling? Pouring? Any kind of doctrine you want to think about, you can ask that question. Is a person saved before they're baptized? Is a person saved by saying the sinner's prayer? Can you find the sinner's prayer in the Bible? Show it to me. Is it from heaven or is it from men? I'm telling you the Bible says that you have to repent of your sins and be immersed in water to have your sins forgiven. And when somebody tells you you can do less than that and still be saved, you ask yourself, is that from heaven or is that from men? Acts 2.38 will answer your question. If you would obey the genuine gospel, you can do that now. 